All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Sarah, and I'm the Mappy Hour founder. And I'm so excited to have everyone here tonight. If you are new to our community, we're all about living in the city or wherever you might live right now and loving the outdoors and sharing our love for the outdoors together and learning and making sure that more people can get outside. So I'm really excited you're here. And I'm so excited that we have Jeremy tonight from the New England Lost Ski Area Project. I actually have been following his site for a few years now. Um, I love history as well and skiing, so kind of a fangirl, so I was pretty excited when he said he would join us. Um, before we do get started, I have a few announcements just to make sure tonight goes smoothly. The first is that we do have comments, um, so feel free to drop your questions in there. Um, Jeremy will answer the questions at the end, uh, but feel free to ask them whenever they come up. Say hi, say where you're from. If you um, have been to one of these places, share that as well. I do wanna note that if you're on mappyhour.org, if you haven't registered, you won't be able to comment. So you'll have to go over to our Facebook to comment. So something we're working on, I do apologize for that. But for now, if you have a question and for some reason you're watching this without having registered, you won't be able to ask on the main site, but facebook.com slash mappyhour or um, the New England Lost Ski Area Project both have this going. So go ask your questions there. All right. Um, and of course, like be nice to each other. I'm gonna be in there. I'm gonna be your moderator. So only kindness and it's it's supposed to be a safe space for everyone. So feel free to ask questions and um, you know, share where, where you are and what, what you're up to these days skiing wise. Um, the final thing is this whole backcountry and exploratory ski series is presented by Sierra Nevada Brewing Co. And they're amazing. They support us doing all sorts of fun stuff. And it's really been fun to be able to explore and talk about snow and skiing this year with them. So with that, um, here's Jeremy. Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the invitation and happy to uh, talk uh, tonight to everybody about the uh, Lost Skiers of the Berkshires. And as Sarah mentioned, just a quick little cheers. Thank you very much, Sierra Nevada, for sponsoring this program. Um, and I hope everybody here enjoys it. So uh, we'll talk about the uh, Lost Skiers of the Berkshires here. And this picture is one from one of my favorite Lost Ski Areas in the Berkshires of Massachusetts. That is Brody Mountain. Um, and it was the largest ski area to ever close across Western Massachusetts. So you can see an old chairlift there, it's from the 1970s, and you can see somebody hang gliding down one of the slopes, and you see some people running up the lift who are apparently totally oblivious to what was going on, and then you see a few people that have turning their heads and being like, what is that that's going on? So we'll talk here um, about, uh, about my website, NELSAP. I'll tell you a little bit about my book, The Lost Skiers of the Berkshires. I'll tell you about what is a lost ski area, because a lot of people ask, well, it's not lost. I can actually tell you where it is. I'll tell you what I mean by lost ski area. I'll tell you a little bit about Berkshire ski history, some types of lost ski areas. I'll tell you how to enjoy these mountains today. I know this is an outdoors group, so I want to make sure that these are all kind of, you know, celebrated with living history, so that even though these ski areas may not be operational in terms of being lift served. Um, they are still available, a lot of them to be explored, hiked, backcountry skied, snowshoe, um, you know, all those kinds of things. So there are, these places are not uh, totally sealed off, dead and abandoned. They actually are still um, being active places today. I'll tell you a little bit about open ski areas that are still around in the Berkshires, how to preserve lost ski areas, and a quick little bit about the New England Ski Museum. I'm on their board as well. So a little bit about NELSAP. The NELSAP stands for the New England and Northeast Lost Ski Areas Project. It was a website I started in my dorm room at Linden State College in Vermont back in 1998. So we're 23 years old, which is a very long time for a website. We still keep the vintage feel on the website on there. And it's a website dedicated to the history of lost ski areas in New England and the Northeast. And we have 700 ski area histories on the site. So if you're ever bored and you want to uh, check it out, go and check it out. And you can kind of go through each one, one by one, and learn all about um, all these ski areas that used to operate across uh, the Northeast and New England. A little bit about the background about the books. Um, I've written five books on lost ski areas, three of which have won um, international awards, which is pretty cool uh, for outstanding regional ski history. 2008, I wrote Lost Ski Areas of the White Mountains. You can see that on the left there. Then I wrote uh, Lost Ski Areas of Southern Vermont. 
then lost ski areas of the Southern Adirondacks and lost ski areas of the Northern Adirondacks in 2014. And in 2018, wrote uh, the last book here and so far in the series, there'll be more in the future. Uh, but this one is on the lost ski areas of the Berkshires. And again, that's going to be our talk tonight. Um, all the books are available on my website and through there's an order link on there as well. A um, little bit of background on the book. Um, in 2015, um, the contract was awarded from Arcadia Publishing. Uh, research and writing uh, took a couple of years to do that, although I've been kind of researching the, these, this topic here over all the years uh, since I started the site and before that. Uh, it was published in November 18, and then this uh, in 2019, it was awarded that Scotty Award for Regional Ski History. So it was pretty cool to be able to uh, take a book like this, uh, you know, this topic on the lost ski areas and be able to uh, get it some international attention and really showcase all of the great history um, that the Berkshires offer. So how do you go about researching a book on a ski area that no longer exist? Well, the best thing to do is talk to people that actually ran them, um, worked at them, uh, family members. Those are the people that have a lot of the primary sources. They got pictures, they have stories, they have all kinds of details that they're happy to share. Um, old guidebooks oftentimes have a lot of information. Um, they can have um, different maps in there. They can have all the statistics, all the kind of the raw data with those. Um, they can have uh, brochures and postcards. Um, eBay was a great source to be able to purchase some of these. And also, thankfully, lots of uh, contributors to the, the book and the site have emailed me a lot of great uh, um, memorabilia that I was able to include within it. Um, you can check out uh, email submissions over the years of NELSAP. I think it's been at least 50,000 emails that I've gotten about all these lost ski areas. So um, people have submitted them on all different topics uh, of all these places. Um, magazines. Um, I've talked about over 1,100 newspaper articles I had to read um, to be able to kind of tell the story of, of all these places. And thankfully, um, all of those articles, you know, were very detailed back in the past that they wrote a lot of uh, great details um, on these mountains. So you can kind of help put together the story by reading a lot of the newspapers. Um, visiting these places, of course, um, you have to be able to go and check them out, um, kind of get the feel of them. So everyone in the book um, was visited or attempted to be visited if it was on private land so that at least you can say that uh, you'd been there and were able to uh, to be able to check it out. Um, the New England Ski Museum, a wonderful resource of ski history located in northern New Hampshire at uh, Franconia Notch at Cannon Mountain as well as in North Conway near Cranmore um, have tremendous archives, extremely helpful for the book. Historical societies, Great Barrington Historical Society, different libraries, colleges, Berkshire Athenaeum. So all these places all had different archives that were all kind of pulled together to kind of tell the story of these places that no longer exist. So in the book, we have 37 lost ski areas. I got 240 pages. Um, there's 80 photos and trail maps. We got pictures of areas um, from uh, before, you know, from before and after shots, which I always find fascinating, kind of see you know, what these areas were like, um, and I'll be happy to uh, be showing you some of these before and after photos during this presentation. Um, there are proposed and open ski areas out there as well. Um, and I also give a guide in each one if they can be explored or not. And if so, how to do that? Like what's there to see? Um, how can you check it out? Because I really encourage people to go off and hike or other, do other outdoor recreation uh, to be able to keep these places going, keep them alive, um, and uh, make sure they're never forgotten about, because a lot of them, again, can still be enjoyed. So uh, this is the book um, on the lost gears of the Berkshires here. I got a copy of the book here, right here as well. Um, so uh, for the, um, uh, you know, for the book here, um, we have a lot of historical uh, uh, brochures here on the cover of that. Um, you can see Beartown ski area in the upper left, Farnham's in the Berkshires. Um, I'll tell you some little bit about the history of both those places. This is a, um, uh, an advertisement here that was in um, uh, to advertise all the uh, railroads, um, that, the snow trains that went out there to the Berkshires. Oak and Spruce, Happy Land, which was a little bit like a Disney World for, uh, for kids out in, the, out in Beckett, Massachusetts that had its own rope tow. Um, and then uh, this area here is uh, another one um, that we have, uh, Jug End, um, and just shows a nice family scene here uh, looking at the, the small ski area. So, all these places are all, all closed, but uh, you know, still live on in a lot of people's memories. 
So then the next question is, what is the Berkshires? You know, where are they um, and what region did I cover? Because sometimes Berkshires, people might think it's all of Western Massachusetts. Um, but with the Berkshires, um, what I did is just all for Berkshire County only. So within the Berkshires, um, those are the 37 ski areas. So for one county, that's kind of a lot. And there's a lot of history kind of packed into that region. Massachusetts, for instance, has almost 160 to 170 close ski areas for the whole state. So you can imagine trying to cover them all in one book is a little bit difficult. So that's why we kept it uh, to just the Berkshires uh, County. But there'll be future books for Massachusetts as well uh, coming up. Um, this is a map that kind of shows where some of these areas are. And it'll be a little difficult potentially for you to see. Um, but the main corridor here is Route 7. Um, it's one of the major roads um, in the Berkshires. And a lot of the areas were located near or along that in some of the bigger towns. Like in, Pitts, in Pittsfield, there were several of these places. Um, down in Great Barrington, there were several of them. Heading up to uh, Williamstown and up to North Adams. Uh, definitely a tremendous amount of those lost areas. You can really see how closely packed together they were. Then you have a few other scattered ones, like around Route 20 out there as well, and a few that are a little bit more isolated, like Marlboro Manor, for instance. So what is a lost ski area? So lost means, doesn't mean that we can't find it. Um, it means that it had to be lift accessible um, and the lifts can no longer be operating. So it's, uh, you know, the lifts are not longer, no longer in use. Um, but we had to have some kind of a lift because otherwise just about every single slope or trail could be considered to be a ski area if, if you use a very broad definition for it. Um, lifts range from rope toes to chairlifts. Um, privately owned ski areas count. Um, and there were no minimum size as well. For instance, about no minimum size, if you can believe it, this park here on the right, Springside Park in Pittsfield, that was a lost ski area. And it's now a garden. Uh, you can see it's not very big of a, of a hill here. A vertical drop was only about 50 to 70 feet. So this is a very tiny place. And if you look very carefully, you can see the former tower here on the rope toe uh, here on the right. So if you never know what you're going to find. You might find a ski lift in the middle of a daffodil field uh, when you're out trying to find out some of these places. But these places were mainly for kids. Um, the kids probably had, probably had a good time here on the slope, no matter how small it was. But this was a very tiny, uh, very easy uh, ski area. Um, so in the Berkshires themselves, there were 44 ski areas that once operated, and only seven remain as of a couple of years ago, same today. Um, lost ski areas, they range everything from these small rope toes to all-inclusive resorts to major ski centers. And they were also lost in all decades uh, from the 1930s into the 2000s. So it's not necessarily a new phenomenon that these places closed. Um, some of these ski areas only lasted for a few years uh, before World War II as well. So there's, there's a wide spectrum of, of when they operated and uh, when they closed. A little bit about Berkshire uh, ski area development. Um, in 1934, the Civilian Conservation Corps um, constructed uh, Mount Greylock's um, uh, the Thunderbolt Trail um, on the mountain. Um, this was the one of the largest uh, ski trails um, constructed by them, and actually one of the biggest ones in New England as well. And uh, for Massachusetts, it was 1.6 miles long, um, had a vertical of 2,050 feet which is about 800 feet higher than the, the next area that uh, uh, below that that we ever had in Massachusetts, which was Brody at about 1250 feet of vertical. So 2000 feet of vertical in Massachusetts is not common to find. I think it only pretty much happened um, on Mount Greylock, um, but the Thunderbolt was a big ski trail, attracted all kinds of competitions and really got people excited about skiing in the region. So as people are getting more interested in skiing and starting to come up uh, to the Berkshires uh, to recreate here in the wintertime, um, this is all, of course, during uh, the Great Depression, you had snow trains um, that started to show up, which could take people from Connecticut, New York, and other in Boston, and take them out to the Berkshires uh, to go skiing. The first snow trains came in 1935 to Bosque, um, and that is a ski area that is still in operation today. Um, and they later grew to serve other places called GBRS Ranch, Beartown, Farnham's, and Abbey Hill. I'll tell you more about those coming up. And what they really did is they allowed the masses from New York City to come up and either day trip or spend a weekend in the Berkshires. So you got to think the depression, how many people have, have their own private transportation, the roads aren't really all that good if there's bad weather, but the trains could easily take people um, from New York City up to these uh, up to these uh, different ski areas here. And the snow trains were you know, essentially like a 
base lodge on on the rails so people could they would pull up to a ski area and people could go back to the train during the day there was food served on there there was a makeshift ski shop and then on the way home everybody partied and drank uh, until they got back to new york so it was definitely a, a fun time for everybody there's a lot of entertainment on board these trains so the whole train was kind of like a uh, um was kind of like a resort in and of itself um, out there as well so that is the um uh kind of a little bit there about those snow trains now the sport started to take off um after that point, we started to get um, ski lifts to be developed. So uh, 1935, the first uh, ski lift was put in um, at Bosquets in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Um, and you can see uh, a picture there of that rope tow. Uh, again, Bosquets is still in operation, but it's a very important ski area that was kind of had the most number of lifts for quite a long time in the Berkshires, a lot of rope toes, and later on uh, added other lifts out there as well. So pretty basic contraption there with the rope toe. For those of you who haven't really skied, you know, you pretty much grab onto that moving rope and it pulls you up to the top um, of the slope there, then you let go. Uh, rope toes are pretty dangerous though, especially the early ones, not so much. Now there's a lot of safety uh, features that have been put on them. And I'll tell you a little bit about one of the horror stories that can happen with the rope toe here about one of the ski areas coming up. So World War II takes place. Um, there are 13 ski areas in the Berkshires at the beginning of it. Um, many of them closed um, during World War II, and some of them were able to innovate um, and uh, try to try to stay open as long as they can, because during World War II, there's a lot of restrictions on them. gasoline usage, um, private transportation. Um, so ski areas were, you know, not uh, all that, uh, you know, involved, um, you know, with, uh, you know, it would be a lot more difficult to go skiing back then now. Of course, we have a lot of restrictions right now with COVID and, and travel. So it's, there's actually a lot of parallels with that. Um, but in World War II, it was even more restricted out there. There were some mountains that had electric toes and electricity use wasn't as curtailed as gasoline was. So um, G Bar S Ranch, which stands for Great Barrington Sports Center, that ski area was able to operate using electric rope toes. Bosquets was able to keep operating for a little while because it had gasoline reserves that they had bought prior to the onset of World War II, but the gas eventually ran out. Um, the area like GBRS Ranch, they kept running these tows and people would take, actually some of them would take the train and then be taken to the mountain um, in uh, horse-drawn uh, carriages essentially, or you know, to be able to get to them because they couldn't actually bring a car to go pick them up at the uh, train station. So after World War II, um, there was a lot of new areas that opened up in the late 1940s and 1950s. A lot of veterans from the 10th Mountain Division came around and started opening up their own ski areas too, like Jacob's Ladder in East Lee. Um, that was built by Floyd Rossi, the 10th Mountain Division veteran. And you also had new resorts open up like Jiminy Peak. And as you can see, the uh, um, the mountain there on the right there, that is uh, Jacob's Ladder. And you can see the snow depth there is not terribly deep. It's only a few inches but it's very typical of what these areas would operate on. You know, they didn't have snowmaking, um, they didn't have uh, grooming imp machines. Uh, they were pretty basic operations. When there was snow, they ran. When there wasn't snow, they didn't. Um, and their seasons were usually pretty brief, uh, sometimes only lasting several weeks um, during a year because the snow, you know, didn't always come. You know, it's a little bit of a myth that back in the day there was snow all the time. Um, during the winters, there was a lot of variable winters then, just like we have a lot of variable winters now, but there's definitely been a downward trend in snowfall um, over the last uh, several decades for sure, but there are also some bad years back in the past as well. Although this picture here, it really looks like they're having fun. It's a, it looks like a warm spring uh, day out there um, at uh, Jacob's Ladder. 1950s and 1960s, this is the peak number of operating areas, kind of when everything peaked. You had a lot of resorts grow in popularity. Uh, you had several of these kind of all-inclusive resorts um, that were around. Um, and this one here is Jug End. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that history here coming up. Um, and yeah, the baby boomers coming up as well. So the baby boomers are becoming kids, they're teenagers. Um, the parents are taking them skiing and there's this huge kind of burst of the population kind of moving up through the ranks people that are enjoying skiing and all these resorts were kind of built or expanded to be able to accommodate them. But that didn't last forever once that, that boom kind of passed. In fact, the last of the new ski areas was uh, Windsor Lake and Adams and that was in 1967. 1970s and 1980s, a lot of the school ski area closed. There was different, some colleges and a lot of private schools had some rope toes um, or their own operations. A lot of them closed during this time frame. A lot of resorts started shutting down. 
Um, and that could be due to inflation, change in vacation habits, and some bad winters. And then we also had the story of Greylock Glen um, in, on the east side of Mount Greylock that became the largest ski area to never open. And I'll explain that story too coming up. The 1990s and 2000s, uh, a lot of uh, ski areas were modernized with new lifts, better snowmaking, and more trails. Um, one of the last resort areas, Eastover, closed in 99, and the lift was moved to Bosque and was just removed this year. Uh, Brody Mountain closed in 2002, which is the last area in the book um, to close. Um, areas started to fade away, and some of these, though, have been restored or being repurposed for other outdoor recreational pursuits. So now what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the different kinds of ski areas um, that were that were built or constructed, kind of some of the categories for that. Um, we'll talk first about those snow train destinations, because these are really interesting, because these are areas that were built specifically for snow trains. Um, these were built and designed for railroad traffic, um, something that you know we just don't have today um, across much of the area. Um, it was built in the, the 40s, um, and the, sorry, in the 30s. Um, the parking lot, just to show you how uh, it was geared towards the train, only had space for eight cars. So that's it. So the parking lot could only hold eight cars at the South Lee train station. You can see some skiers there on the left getting off the train. You can just see there's a small parking lot there next to it. Now, despite the fact that it you know, was geared towards the train and only had a small parking space, it was a sizable spot. It had a vertical of about 820 feet, had multiple rope toes, but that lack of parking really hindered development. And it's not that they couldn't expand the lot. There just wasn't the land available near there to do that. That wasn't on a steep slope. Um, there were different owners uh, that tried to keep it going, but they unfortunately did all close uh, the whole mountain there in uh, 1964. This is the trail map of Beartown. Um, and you can see some of the different rope toes that were here. The, the lodge was built here by the Civilian Conservation Corps. There was a rope toe here um, with a couple of the exit ramps you can see coming off the toe. Um, there was another beginner toe over here on this slope, Sedgwick slope. And then you had this upper toe to the top, which I have hiked up and is extremely steep. Um, so it's a pretty tough one to go check out. But you can see a lot of the trails, the old fashioned New England trails, narrow and twisty, but there are also a few slopes out there as well. So this was a pretty big place. Um, you know, and it was in the heart of the Berkshire snow belt, as they said. Um, and uh, definitely one of the big ones. And if it had made it, if they had, were able to put in a chairlift or something later on, um, it probably would still be in operation today. Now, a little interesting quote about this Beartown ski area, March 8th and 9th, 1936, was a pretty warm weekend. Um, and this is a quote from the uh, local paper that said that skiers believe they were ski witnessing skiing on a borax slide at Miami as many of the skiers removed their outer garments. A really pretty warm weekend. But I find that a very interesting uh, description there of uh, treating the ski area um, as like a borax slide in Miami. But then this quote was pretty interesting where it says that a skier ran into the island of trees midway down the novice trail and returned to New York City with his face looking like raw beefsteak and both eyes completely closed closed. And it sounds like a nasty uh, injury there for that. Um, and that's what happened to a lot of these you know, early places. There wasn't much of an instruction. Some of them, the ski patrols really hadn't been formed yet. Um, so there was a lot of accidents that took place. Uh, conditions were pretty rough. The, the equipment was pretty rough. So you had a lot of stories like that about all the accidents that, uh, that used to happen. Now, the base lodge here, this was built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, sometimes referred to as the Forest Service Lodge. Um, it's a very classic looking lodge there. It was for rest, warmth, and food, and its cheery fireplace adds a pleasant note to the day ski. Um, and you can see that lodge there. Again, it looks like a classic lodge. You can see some of the slopes there in the background. And what's very interesting is in the book, too, I explain how you can go hike in there and see the remnants of it, because today, the lodge remnants, the fireplaces are still standing, which I find fascinating. So these are built by the Civilian Conservation Corps, you know, almost 90 years ago. Um, and deep in the woods, there's these two fireplaces that were part of that ski lodge. Um, and when you walk up and check out those fireplaces, they look probably about as new as they, as good as they did when they were built. They were really built with a lot of high quality, um, you know, stones, a lot of great workmanship. And that's what's amazing, you know. So if you don't know that that was a skier and you're walking out in the woods, you'd be wondering, you know, what is the story uh, of this place? So I'll go back for a second there. You can see the two fireplaces and there it is today. So it's kind of a sad and haunting kind of scene out there when you're deep in the woods and you find um, these fireplaces. But uh, I tell all about in the book, I can go and check that all out. 
Um, another one of these snow train destinations was Farnham's um, in the Berkshires. Um, it's in Cheshire, Mass. Um, and their, their logo, as you can see here, is three minutes from train to tow. So you get off the train, and three minutes later, you're going up the rope tow. Um, you can see the, um, the, train the train here and where they're able to unload the passengers uh, when they walk across the street and then hop onto a tow and kind of more of these toes here and kind of make their way up to the top of the mountain here where you have several more other toes and trails out there for them to explore. This is probably the New York Central and Boston Albany snow trains that ran Sundays and holidays. Um, and again, they'd be skiing out there for, um, uh, you know, for the whole day. You can see some of the trail names here. One of them, if you can read that, says the Graham Slam. Um, it was built by Leo Graham, um, who, who started the ski area out there. And uh, we talk all about the history of that there in the book. But it was really neat because, yeah, there's the train station, walk across the street, hop up onto it. What's interesting is that snow train platform where people got off, or at least where the the passengers would unload um, is still very visible. This is the uh, Shulatuk Rail Trail um, that goes uh, from uh, North Adams down to the Berkshire Mall. And right before the reservoir there, if you're going northbound, um, you can come up here to where the trains used to let uh, the passengers off. Um, the ski area would be out over here to the right, um, over here to the right. And uh, but yeah, this is where they would they would be let off. So you wonder how many cyclists and runners uh, going past the scene um, would be able to even have known that there used to be um, you know a ski area across the street, and this is where the passengers uh, got out. But this is an example of one of the places I talk about that you can go and check out and and kind of explore on your own. Not so much the, the ski area itself is on private property, but this part on the rail trail is very easily easily accessible for everybody. Then we have, after World War II, um, we had a, a lot of private businesses start some of these places. Um, well, actually, I'm sorry, before World War II. Um, and then there's one of these called the first Brody Mountain, uh, Brody Mountain Ski Trails. And this is a kind of a funny story because Gregory Makarov, he was a Russian native um, and had these big ideas like making Brody a national park. Uh, trying to make it uh, have some uh, publicity. He built an 1100 foot rope tow. Um, and then right next door, this other area opened up the following year called the Brody Mountain Sports Center. Um, it literally was right next door. You could you know, throw a stone from one trail to the other, but it was such an, it was almost the same name. And he took them to court um, to get them to change their name um, because it was, uh, they were copying him and he won and the area next door to him actually closed. Now, during World War II, he was trying to find alternatives to, to stay in business um, to let people be able to have gasoline to drive to his ski area. And one of the things he tried to promote was to drill for oil um, in Massachusetts, which there really isn't any oil in Massachusetts, but he was trying to get uh, people to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, he also tried to operate his ski area as a church during World War II because uh, churches were exempt from the travel restrictions. So he had an advertisement to try to get uh, as he called it, a hard-boiled minister to give services on the slopes on Sundays. Um, so you can kind of see how people are trying to get around driving restrictions and travel restrictions even back, you know, 80 years ago. So it's kind of similar to what we have out there today, uh, where people are, um, you know, skiers and businesses are doing what they can to stay going here in the pandemic. Um, it's nothing new, actually. There were different, different kinds of restrictions for totally different reasons, but back then, uh, people did try to try to innovate during those time frames. In the last uh, year of its operation, um, Walt Schonkenek, uh, 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 he, uh, he built, uh, he, he was the manager here at, uh, at Brody Mountain Ski Trails. He later went on to found uh, Mohawk Mountain in Connecticut, one of the snowmaking pioneer ski areas. And then a few skied up Vermont, Mount Snow in Vermont. Um, he founded that one, that was his big project. Um, and he got his start there at this small uh, rope toe ski area. We were very lucky to be able to have a contributor to the book um, share some photos that he had had from a photo album that showed the base lodge of this. Um, and, you know, it's pretty much the same. This is the very late 30s, and you can see the ski rack out front, and it looks very much like we do today with having the ski rack or people leaving their skis in the snow um, at, you know, outside the ski area. Um, and that says uh, Brody Mountain Ski Tow here um, on that sign. This is actually a house now that's still standing, but it is a private home, as the trails are in the background as well. 
just a picture from uh, from Brody, uh, the original Brody here, uh, showing one of the skiers. And you know, I always find the fashion of these skiers pretty uh, pretty interesting. You know, wearing a bow tie and no hat um, and trying to uh, to get down uh, the mountain. So um, definitely kind of a cool picture there to show how things have changed. So after World War II, um, we started having some more private businesses come in, and one of them was the Thunderbolt Ski Area. Um, this is an area that almost nobody's ever heard of. Um, it was founded by Roger Picard, um, who had a who was on his family farm on the east side of Mount Greylock. It opened on January 11th, 1958. Um, the ticket prices were $1.75 for adults, $1 for children, um, and he planned to add a T-bar to reach uh, the Thunderbolt Trail, which is above their family property. So this is a family farm. They have the land, um, and uh, he tried to open a ski area. For those of you that don't know what a T-bar is, I do have an example here. This is from my home mountain where I learned to ski in Massachusetts, Neshoba Valley, but kind of see one of the T-bars here uh, for that. So this would drag you up the slope. Um, and uh, they wanted to do that and add that there um, to his uh, ski area besides his rope toe. We never got the chance um, because um, it only operated for a few weekends. On February 1st, 1958, um, he was riding up the uh, the ski lift. He could turn it on from the bottom, but the, ga the uh, gas was at the top of the engine. So he was riding up the lift, um, carrying the gas can, and uh, his uh, parka got caught up in the rope toe and started to twist and couldn't get out. Um, and he went through all the machinery at the top um, and nearly killed him. It's incredibly ser serious injuries um, and uh, was in the hospital for a year uh, to be able to recover. Um, and a pretty pretty tough story out there for that. Um, the area later became, the family farm was sold and uh, became part of Greylock Glen, which is the largest area to never open. I'll talk about that again coming up. But with Roger Picard, he did live into his 80s. He just passed away, I believe, a year or two ago. I was actually able to find him for this article. There's not too many people up for the, for the book. There's not too many people that started ski areas in the 50s that are still with us. And I just kind of on a whim tried to look him up and see if he was still living and found out there was someone by that exact same name almost right next door to where that ski area was. Called up, left a message on his machine, uh, said, I'm trying to find information um, about this Thunderbolt ski area. Um, I got a call right back. Um, and he said, I, I can't believe that anybody's interested in this. You've made my day. I haven't talked about this ski area in decades. Um, I got to tell you all about it. Um, came down and then interviewed him for it. So it's one of these very, um, you know, kind of the rare chances that we have is a lot of these ski area founders are getting quite up there in age. And I just happen to be at the right place, right time, and be able to get his story so it wouldn't be forgotten about and get his first hand account of it. This was a copy of his uh, brochure here, um, the Thunderbolt Ski Area um, in the lovely Berkshires. And again, I'll show some pictures of one more picture of that coming up here. There was another thing that we had a lot of is ski club areas. Um, one of those is uh, Sheep Pastures, which was run by the Thunderbolt Ski Club at the end of the Thunderbolt Trail of the Gould Farm, which is pretty much next to where that Picard Farm was um, that I told you about earlier. Um, it had a practice slope. It had a rope toe that opened in 1940, closed during World War II, and then came back for a few years in the late 40s, early 50s, before it was eventually moved to Forest Park um, down in, uh, in Adams. This is a picture of the sheep pastures. Look at all the crowds coming up to watch uh, some of the racing there at the Thunderbolt Trail. And there was a rope tow that was added up where those telephone poles were a little bit later on. But these ski areas had a pretty good, um, you know, attraction for a lot of people to come up and watch the races and all the different events. Now, this is interesting because this is Roger Picard's farm. Um, where he is now, where he was a few years ago before he passed away at his house. Uh, he only moved pretty much one farm over to where that sheep pastures was. And you can see one of the telephone poles there, the power lines, I should say, going up the mountain here. So this is where that rope toe was, not his, but that sheep pastures. And as he's out there, he says, I got something to show you. And everybody can see um, this garden here. That's his tomato garden. Well, that is the former drive building for the rope toe. So that's the foundation for it here. Um, and he turned it into uh, his uh, tomato garden. I thought that was a very, very cool and creative use of, an, of the remnants of an old building that used to have a, a, ski, uh, a ski lift in it out there as well. So again, very glad got the chance to be able to go out there and, uh, and meet him. 
Another one of these ski clubs was the Elk Practice Slope. Um, if you're ever on Route 2 going east of Adams, you go by the Elk. Um, there's a, a statue out there for it, um, and they, the Ski Runners of Adams Ski Club, and uh, they would have outings up there at the Elk Practice Slope, which wasn't a very big slope, but uh, did allow for them to go out there and practice. And so there's the club out there skiing. And again, the fashion choices are always interesting with some people just wearing some caps and people wearing their shirt and ties to go uh, go skiing. And certainly things have come a long way uh, since back in those days. Then we had to move the rope to a place called Bernard's in the Notch, um, which is on the drive, the road up to the summit of uh, Mount Grey Lock. And I'll tell you on the book how you can kind of peek out and from a parking lot there and still be able to see roughly where the, the ski area was. But you can see here it had a rope tow um, and had a couple trails with it. Then there were these municipal ski areas that were around. One of those, Clapp Park in Pittsfield, um, it had, um, excuse me, it had didn't have it had non lift service lessons in the 1940s where people had to hike up and then ski down. It did get a rope tow 600 feet long in 1952. Um, the program for the town of uh, the recreation department was later moved to Osceola Park, um, and that's actually still open. I'll show you a picture of that coming up. Um, but today it's athletic fields and a track, and this is Clapp Park. So this is an easy one to go check out. You can park and then walk the track and then see where the ski area was, which was on this wide open slope here uh, behind, behind it. Vertical drop on that is only about 40 to 50 feet, so definitely one for kids, um, but still kind of a neat little place to go check out if you're in Pittsfield. It's an easy lost ski area to go and, and, and walk and explore. Um, you're not going to see any real remnants there. The lift is long gone, um, but you can go up there and kind of walk around. Then you had school and college ski areas. Those were popping up everywhere. Um, Williams College uh, had Sheep Hill, and there's also the Ralph Townsend ski area. Um, Williams College Outing Club, which was a big uh, college outing club, started in 1915. Um, and then the ski team was founded in 1919. Roland Palmetto was the captain. He later uh, built a single chairlift at Stowe and, and opened up Matter of Glen, Vermont, if you've been up there. Um, they partnered with Arthur and Ella Rosenberg's farm on Sheep Hill, um, which wasn't too far uh, out of, only a few miles away from the college um, site of their big winter carnival. They built a rope tow there in the summer of 36, opened up in 37. Lowell Thomas was a famous broadcaster, visited in 38, and it later shut down during World War II. Um, it kept expanding, added a couple of toads in the late 40s, um, and then in 1951, um, it had one of its busiest days ever with a thousand ski areas enjoying the slopes. That's huge. Lots of students and locals getting out there on that day. Later, the Rosenbergs opened it, operated it for a few years in the mid-50s, but it had really bad snow. It was a low elevation and it faced southeast, which is not a good direction for a ski area at all. Um, that led to a search for a new ski area, um, led them to Berlin Mountain, which is about five miles away much bigger place, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and then that became the Williams College ski area, later the Ralph Townsend ski area. He was a ski coach there for, for many years. Um, it was used for ski team and winter carnivals, and it had a very uh, steep slalom slope and the biggest vertical drop of any college ski area in the East, which is very impressive. I'll show you pictures of here coming up with that. Even had a couple jumps, had a 500 car parking lot. Again, major colleges and universities competed in this winter carnival, but it was vandalized quite a lot. Um, a lot of these ski areas were targets for vandalism. Um, it did have a lift put in 66 that went halfway up the slope. It wound down in 1979 and later on the rope tow was moved over to, uh, to Brody Mountain. So starting off with the history of those two places there from the college, there's Sheep Hill. You can see one of the jumps there. Um, looks like there's a lot of people still walking around uh, right around that, that, that jump there, but you can see um, the skier here taking off uh, at Sheep Hill. Uh, there's the rope tow. People riding up the rope tow. You can see a nice wide open slope here with a lot of different pitches and, and drops and a few trees out there as well. And then they did move to that Ralph Townsend ski area, again, that much bigger place. And this slalom slope here is incredibly steep. Uh, it was so steep that they couldn't groom it um, going up the hill. They had to come down it. So they actually had to build a cat track that came all the way around the side of the mountain. And then eventually here at the top, this is where their downhill uh, racing trail is. Um, and then they had to kind of, or they had to hand pack it um, down with their own skis. But this is incredibly steep. I've been up there and it is it's a very tough slope to try to hike down, um, but really tremendous uh, for, for racing there. And you can see this huge parking lot they had out there as well. 
There's a couple of the ski jumps that they had. Um, they were natural jumps. So they weren't made out of wood, um, but they were carved out into the mountainside. There's the, the judge's platform, the staircase to go up it, and you can see the two jumps. What's incredible is that you can still go out in the woods and find out where these are, and there's one of the jumps right there. So it's uh, getting pretty overgrown, um, but I tell you how to go out there and explore these places um, if you are so inclined to go check them out, which I bet a lot of you will, especially once the pandemic is you know, getting over and some of the restrictions get lifted. Um, these can make for some, some definitely some fun explorations for you to go and check out. The Berkshire School, it's a private high school um, there in the Berkshires. Um, they also had th their own rope toe and, and jump. So a lot of these schools had their own as a good way to attract students and give them something to do during the winter months. Then we can build up to resorts and major ski areas. So these are for all-inclusive resorts, um, which had their own ski areas, most of them on the small side, like Avalok, which is the last home of Alice's Restaurant um, from uh, Guthrie's song there, um, Eastover, Jug End, Oak and Spruce, Leisure Lee, and Marlboro Manor were all, all kind of all-inclusive resorts for that. Um, they were designed to teach new skiers uh, and try to get some repeat business, but once people learn to ski at them, they were typically small enough that uh, they wouldn't come back year after year. They would move on to other places. Uh, they were very family oriented, but they also had an outreach to singles, so they had some singles weekends and weeks. Uh, many of them were too small to uh, compete with the larger skiers that were being built all around them. Um, one of them is, which was very, which was one of the largest of these kind of resort ones, was Jug End in South Egremont. Um, this is now um, uh, public land, so you go up and explore it. But the original ski area was kind of down here on the right. You can see some of the rope toes, and they had a T-bar lift here as well. Um, but they did plan eventually on building a chairlift at the top, and I talk about the story of that chairlift that never happened. And this was a racing trail, and actually part of this was cut um, so that if you go up there now in the woods, you can just make out where that trail used to be. So they were going to try to compete and make it a thousand foot vertical mountain. Um, but unfortunately, they never quite had the funds to be able to do that. Jugan, again, big resort. Um, it was one of these summer resorts here that expanded to, or, or kind of had the, the skiing as a major asset here during the winter months. And it did have some snowmaking capabilities. And you can really see here, and like in this picture here, because they did have a little bit of some early snowmaking, that the slope is still covered in snow but the valley here is totally out of snow um, and then there's the resort down there below if you go there today this was in 2017 where i had a chance to go up there and hike it that's pretty much the same view i'll go back you can see one of the mountain peaks over here um and then here it is there um slope is pretty well over it's starting to get overgrown although you can still make your way down it in the last few years it hasn't been quite as cleared by the state um, they had work to try to keep some of these open as like an open meadow but it's becoming kind of increasingly overgrown here um, it was uh, pretty much run by uh, um, Angus and Mimi McDonald um, they were some of the first people that were promoting a lot of this uh, resort activities in life um, it was a barn um, they converted the barn into uh, into lodging. You can see the silo there. Um, this is the bridge where people would walk to get to the ski area, which was a little bit of a ways away. Uh, this is inside the ski lodge. Um, pretty rustic, but people getting their skis tuned or getting set up for, uh, for rentals here uh, inside the lodge. And another area that we had was Eastover um, in Lenox. Um, and they had a very interesting lift here. Um, they also had one of the first kind of lift served uh, tubing uh, areas, although it wasn't a tube, it was a toboggan. So they had a toboggan chute. This lift was kind of like a truck tow. So it got pulled up by a cable um, up this track and you can see all the toboggans that they would attach to the end of it. And there's also skiers here as well. You can see some skiers here going down the slope. So it's kind of a dual purpose lift and one of the only ones ever built uh, like that. Later on, it was replaced by a chairlift. And there's the chairlift right there. Um, they also had a mansion that was there. So it's definitely a very different kind of uh, experience here at the ski area. It's now a spa, actually. Um, and they had top-notch ski instructors, free lessons on the slope, and then the chairlift. Um, and a few different uh, trails were available to be able to ski here. Oak and Spruce. Um, this was another, um, it's still there actually um, as a you know different kind of, well, still an open resort out there. They don't offer the skiing anymore, but when they did, they had a, a small slope there and a rope tow and a lot of lessons. And a lot of people did learn to ski here at Oak and Spruce, uh, which is near Lee, Massachusetts. I was able to get the, a picture pretty much from the same shot 
Um, this was in the early 2000s, um, where the uh, they had built more condos and townhouses and those kinds of things here at the slope. This is at the top of where the ski area was. If you look carefully, you can see the top one of the rope tow towers. Can you see that right here? So that's one of the towers here for the rope tow. Um, and uh, that way uh, you can kind of see that this was still a ski area, but um, when I went to explore this area, I checked in with their front desk about wanting to go check out the ski area on their slope, the history of it, and they had no idea what I was talking about because <laughs> they were newer staff and didn't really know about the history of the place. So uh, I told them, yeah, there used to be a ski area out there. And mind if I go explore? And they said, no, oh, yeah, go ahead and check it out. Um, and we're out there and we're able to find what was left of that toe. So the biggest resort, Brody Mountain, um, this was the largest ski area to uh, close in southern New England. Um, it operated from 64 to 2002. It was long a favorite of many capital district out of Albany skiers, but people from New York City out there as well. Had a good location on Route 7, 1,250 foot vertical drop, had 30 trails, and had night skiing and some uh, and uh, pretty long seasons um, out there. They were oftentimes opening open even before Killington would. Um, and it was opened by Jim Kelly and his family. Um, he had had a logging operation there before. Um, it had an Irish theme. You can go on YouTube and Google that, uh, or check it out on YouTube, do a search on there, I should say, uh, for their St. Patrick's Day uh, celebrations that they had there. Um, they had many famous visitors over the year, Tony Matt, Nelson Rockefeller, the Kennedys, Lowell Thomas, expanded through the 60s and 70s. Um, they even had a, uh, a wind turbine windmill installed in the summit during the energy crisis of the 70s, so they were a little bit ahead of, ahead of their time. Um, Brody in the 1990s had its own website, which is actually one of only two lost areas to have one. The other is Eastover. It was purchased by Jiminy Peak in 99. They were going to add a high-speed quad, but there was a lot of uh, money that was going to have to be invested in the mountain to bring it back up to speed, and that never took place. Closed in 2002. Lease for snow tubing after that, um, and now the lifts uh, and lodges have been torn down, and the area is on private property. So you can't explore it, although you can see the mountain from a little bit from the road off Route 7. You can also see it from the top of Mount Greylock. And it was a big one. You can see this trail map here um, showing the four chairlifts uh, here with Brody. Um, wide variety of trails. I mean, this was a major ski area. You could go here for a weekend and, and really enjoy yourself and have a lot of great skiing out there. Um, and it's definitely a shame that it closed. A lot of people are, you know, this was a very amount that was very close to a lot of people. But, you know, it's it's unfortunately one of these things for these places where, um, you know, they do require a lot of maintenance and a lot of cost to keep them up. And, um, you know, there's only space for so many of these places uh, to be able to operate. And unfortunately, once in a while here, we lose one of these places for good. And Brody was one of those. <laughs> there's one of their uh, brochure covers. Um, you can kind of see uh, how they were very much a, a Irish themed ski area with their uh, clover there. There's some people riding up the rope toe there and the base lodge in the background. Again, that's all been torn down now. Um, they had a slush cup here. This is um, on uh, St. Patrick's Day um, to be able to either try to ski across or do uh, different uh, um, different jumps here into the water. And you can see the skier here is about to get very a very cold dunk here um, in this pool of water below here at Brody. Now that this was in color, it would show that it was green as well you know, for St. Patrick's Day. So another area um, that is the largest area to never open um, is Greylock Glen. I kind of hinted at that earlier. Uh, again, it was the largest skier to be built partially, partially built in the east. Uh, it was plans to be a moderately sized kind of beginner intermediate mountain with a vertical of 700 feet. Had three chairs and a J-bar, and all of those were partially installed. The foundations for the base lodge was poured. It ran out of money just before it was completed. It did have a cross-country ski area that was associated with it that did operate briefly for a few years in the mid-70s before that closed. This is a proposed, this was the, the trail map um, from Greylock Glen, and you can see kind of the beginner J-bar over here, and then you had uh, three different uh, chairlifts that were here, some wide open slopes, some narrower trails as well. Um, and everything was all planned. I mean, they had everything ready to go. They had their ticket prices. They had their promotional material here. Um, and they were all set. And, you know, but the money ran out. Um, and uh, there was definitely some financial issues with the development here. And you can actually see where the money ran out here in a second. I'll show you. So this is them trying to con uh, constructing uh, Mount Greylock. You can, the Greylock Land, you can see Mount Greylock here in the background. Again, the uh, tallest peak in southern New England. You can see the ski trails here, the wide open slopes, and some of the narrow trails as well. 
you can see here building up one of the chair lifts here, kind of the, uh, you know, the installation of this uh, double chair, uh, one of the beginner ones. Um, this is great here because it shows the drive building for one of the uh, uh, chair lifts being constructed. Uh, you can see the foundations for the base lodge here in the background. And what's incredible is this is pretty much all they got done. And hiking in the woods today, you can still see the remnants of that, which I find just incredible. So there's the the uh, one of the lower towers there for the uh, chairlift. You can see some of the foundations here that were built. All the wood is gone. But again, there's the foundation. There's the tower. And here it is uh, recently as well. There's a hiking trail that goes right past this. It's very easy to hike. I tell people how, in the book how to get to it. Um, you can go out there and explore this very, very easily and see all of these sites. You can see one of the chairlifts there deep in the woods getting covered in vines and trees growing all around it. Um, you know, but you can see that it wasn't finished. So the chairlift, the cables aren't on there. The chairs aren't on there. Um, but there it is. Um, and if you want to enjoy these lost areas today, um, there's a lot of ways you can do that because, as I mentioned, a lot of them are lost, but they're still vibrant places. They're open for hiking, backcountry skiing, mountain biking. Some are public parks, some are in conservation land, private property. So you got to be careful to make sure you're not going to go be trespass behind someone's uh, house. But I do tell you the book which ones are available and which ones are not. Um, and you can check those out. Now, one of those areas, Bear Town, I mentioned that before. Some of the ski trails there, someone's been clearing them or they were still clear when I went up there. This is one of the top trails there at the top of the mountain. It's pretty narrow. The pictures never do things justice. It's steeper than it looks, um, but you can hike up that. You can ski down it if you really wanted to. I know we've got some backcountry skiers here watching, so you can be able to go ahead and uh, check that out. Um, but I tell people how to get to the, the trails there at Bear Town. But Bear Town's a good one. It's on state land. There's no restrictions to go in there and enjoy it with non-motorized uh, uh, sports. Barnum's, you know, the off the rail trail there. We talked about that earlier, but that's another very easy one. There's a parking lot here right up uh, right where this gate is. So if you're ever in that area, it's a very quick stop. You can see where that uh, train station uh, was uh, for the ski train. Great Log Glen again, very easy to hike up and down. There are several trails and there's mountain bike trails that have been cut through here and backcountry ski trails that have also been cut. So Greylock Glen, um, very busy place. There's a lot of people in that area that go out and enjoy it, hike it, bike it, ski it. Um, so even though the lifts are standing but never finished, you can still go ahead and check that out. Dug End, it's another one, state land. Um, you can see this is the old T-bar lift line here. You can walk up. That part is still pretty clear. And then you kind of hike up through here and then kind of make your way down through the slopes. For all of these, for the most of them anyway, they're best to be explored in the wintertime um, or very early spring or very late fall um, where, you know, double check and make sure about hunting season restrictions and wear bright uh, clothes if you're out there doing that. But that can be the time of the year where ticks are less active, especially in the wintertime. Um, and in the summertime, there's just so much growth. There's so many leaves, there's vines, um, there's thorns. It's uh, not as pleasant to go up and hike and, uh, and explore these places. It's best, best to be done during the colder months. Jug End, that is where the that big barn was that I talked about for that one. That's another state reservation there. Again, I was talking about you can go in there, lots of trails, easy to get and explore. It's free to go in there and check it out. At Ralph Townsend Ski Area, um, that's another one in Berlin Mountain that you can go and explore. Um, hiking up that slope there is going to be pretty pretty steep. It's a lot steeper than it appears here in this picture, but you can see that some people have kept it clear. If you look carefully, you can actually see how wide it was originally. This is the edge of the slope. This is the edge of the slope, and you can see where it's grown in on the sides of it, but the center part has been kept clear, so you can backcountry ski um, and get in there and check it out still. Sheep Hill, this is a great one there. It's a uh, conservation land. Uh, the uh, Rural Land Trust there, I believe, in Williamstown. This is where that farm is. There's a visitor center here. Um, you know, with COVID restrictions, it's a little bit different, but I think you can still get up there and enjoy all the trails that are cut through where the ski area used to be. This spot here is where the jump was. Um, you can kind of see where this little knoll was. It's got a great view of Mount Greylock here in the background. So it's a really fun one to hike up. You can take kids, you take family there. It's very easy to check out. Highly recommend it. There's a trail map at the bottom of it. It's a good example of one of these places that you can still go to um, and enjoy. Now, 
with all that kind of doom and gloom about all these other lost areas, there's still seven areas that still continue to operate. Uh, they range from a community rope tow to a major resort. Um, if your travel restrictions allow and, and you're able to go up to the Berkshires um, this winter time, um, these ski areas definitely would appreciate the business. Um, but a lot of them are doing pretty good. A lot of people have been supporting these smaller ski areas. Even some of these are medium sized areas um, because people haven't been able to travel out west, for instance, and they still want to ski. So they're actually doing okay. Um, and there's still a wide variety of slopes out there to check out. Catamount. Um, it's, it's on the Massachusetts, New York border. The state border again goes right through the center of the ski area. This is from the catapult trail. It's a double black diamond. It is actually very steep um, and for the Berkshires and it's a very enjoyable ski area. There's been a lot of improvements made here over the last few years um, with new lift and several new trails out there as well. So Catamount's a great kind of mid mountain, mid range uh, size mountain. A couple of historical pictures of Catamount here. I'm showing it here um, in the early 1950s when I had a series of rope toes to the top, no chairlifts. So that would have been pretty, uh, a lot of strain in your arms to be able to go up there uh, to the top of Catamount and some of the old artwork for it. Osceola Park, it's a community rope tow. Most people use it for tubing, um, but it's still available for skiing. You can see the rope tow here. This is in Pittsfield again. Vertical drop on that is about 100 feet. So it's a very uh, small ski area, but um, it's still open on weekends when there's uh, natural snow. Mount Greylock Ski Club. This is a private ski area that people can join up though. It's not an expensive club. It's not an exclusive club. They welcome new members um, and it's, it's a classic ski experience. They have two rope toes. They still use rope toe grippers, which um, you are used to kind of clamp onto the toe to be able to ride up it. All natural snow, about a 300 foot drop. It's a really beautiful spot uh, to be able to ski. So if you're interested in joining kind of a private ski club uh, that has their own toes, uh, that's a very affordable one to be able to do so. Bosquets, uh, they're still open. Now this lift here was their summit chairlift. It's just been replaced by a triple chairlift, um, but it's a great historical mountain. Again, been in business here uh, since the mid 30s. So it's a very historical ski area to go check out. Otis Ridge, um, this is in Otis, Massachusetts. It's got about a 300 foot drop chairlift and a few other beginner lifts um, and a T-bar. Um, and this chairlift here was actually moved from another lost ski area in eastern Massachusetts called Flag Hill in Acton, Massachusetts. It was moved out there to uh, Otis after that closed. So it was a great way to recycle an old ski lift and also to provide a better way to get up to the top of the mountain. Jiminy Peak, which is pretty much the largest resort that's still open in the Berkshires. Uh, 1,100 foot drop, good views out there as well. A lot of variety of terrain, definitely a, a more modern type ski area. Um, it's kind of similar to some areas farther north in Vermont or New Hampshire, but another great place to ski. Butternut, good family ski area, a lot of variety here too, 1,000 foot drop. Uh, one of the few skiers that ever been hit by a tornado. Um, back in uh, 1995, a tornado went right across uh, the ski area here, F3, and pretty much destroyed some of the lifts here. Um, they were able to repair them. Uh, those chairs on this lift were actually found thrown into the woods hundreds of feet away. Um, and uh, but it's a pretty neat neat ski area. Check out a lot of history to that one as well. That is grew out of the remnants of the G bar S ski area that I talked about earlier. So just some final thoughts here as we wrap it up. Um, you know the there was 37 ski areas that have closed and that's made a large impact on the region. Um, the largest impact is with the uh, um, small community ski areas. The number of ski areas is pretty much stabilized. I don't think any of the lost areas are going to come back. Um, but now is the time to preserve these lost areas um, as they disappear and those who own them, work for them and ski with them get, get older. You know, who knows what will happen with COVID, but from my, what I have seen for a lot of these places across New England and the Northeast is that even with COVID, they may actually be doing better this year in some cases. Um, there's a lot of people that are just desperate to get outside for outdoor recreation. So there are still opportunities and skiing is relatively safe compared to other activities, especially if you don't go inside and use the lodge. Um, you, know, you can tailgate your car. Um, you know, you're wearing you know, a neck warmer covering your face anyway. You're wearing gloves. Um, it's, it's, it's safer than a lot of other indoor activities. So people are desperate to get outside and a lot of ski areas are doing surprisingly well and are actually selling out on some days. So you never know. Sometimes COVID can have some, some positive side effects too. There's not many of them as we all know, but once in a while, sometimes if people stay local, they can support these places to kind of keep them going. If you have any of these, um, 
in, in memories or photos of any of these places. You can always contribute your memories to NELSAP, always sharing your memories with family and friends, visit and support historical societies, keep on skiing, again, support these local places and support ski museums and other organizations like the International Skiing History Association. A couple of quick things about the New England Ski Museum, I'm on the board there. Forever up in Franconia Notch, New Hampshire, uh, next to Cannon Mountain, definitely go check out the New England Ski Museum's Franconia branch. They are open during COVID with uh, restrictions, but maximum capacity of 10 visitors, but highly recommend that you go and check that out. Amazing displays of all kinds of things about ski history. Same thing at the Eastern Slopes branch, which is in North Conway, and we have a Lost Ski Area exhibit there as well. So if you're up in Northern New Hampshire, go check it out. It's right downtown, right near the train station, as you can see here. So uh, with that, uh, presentation is done, and uh, Sarah, I'd be happy to uh, you come on and we can uh, answer some questions. All right. Hello. Um, thank you, Jeremy. That was awesome. Thank you. There's so much in there, and I feel like that's just like such a, that's like one small region, and there's it is. <laughs> a lot it really more. Is. Yeah. It, and that's what's amazing about these, the, you know, as you explore these lost areas, there's so many different ways that you can, you know, research them and document them um, and, uh, you know, and, and learn more about them, whether you're looking at like the physical ski area itself, the land, the landscape, how that changes, uh, the yeah. business aspect of it, the family aspect of it, you know, because a lot of people, you know, have very strong ties uh, to these places. They grew up there, their family was there. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia and strong memories with them as well. So, yeah, and I should shout out. We have a few people who are participating. Um, one person who skied Old Thunder Mountain, now Berkshire East, um, mm -hmm. and then uh, someone else who uh, was friends with or uh, yeah, related to the people who uh, were the last ones to run Happy Land. So we definitely oh, have. Great some people in here who who intimately know this ski history that's terrific yeah yeah that's great that's awesome yeah. that's awesome very glad to hear yeah all right cool. so we don't have a ton of questions um mm -hmm. but i'll get started and if you know if anyone else does have a question feel free to uh drop them in so mm -hmm. the first one is um all right any tips for good areas to go out and earn some turns these days that's kind of part one. Part two of the same question. Have you found success contacting and asking land loaner, landowners of closed areas for permission to ski? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are some good questions. So the good ones to kind of go out and make your own turns in the Berkshires that I would recommend, that Beartown one is a really good one because you really want to look for ones that are on state land or on public property. Those are the ones that are going to give you the, yeah, the, yeah. It gives you the, the, the mo least amount of grief uh, trying to go and check yeah. them out. Um, and there are some of those. So that, like Bear Town's a great one. Um, you can go out to that uh, Ralph Townsend ski area on Berlin Mountain. There's another area that's on the Mass New York border um, called Petersburg Pass that is almost in the Berkshires. It's You can throw a stone and get there, but it is all on the New York side. But there is a little bit of backcountry skiing in there. Um, but for a lot of these places, you know, so you have some of those, like, yeah, like I said, like Beartown or even that Greylock Glen, because that's another one. It's on state. It's on you know, public land to be able to go ahead and check it out. Those are your best bets. The ones that are on the private property, for the most part, aren't going to really have the same kinds of, you know, experiences for people that want to go back country because a lot of them are overgrown. Um, they may not have as much vertical drop. They're, it's not going to be really worth your time, for instance, to go in there and check them out. So a lot of these ones that are on the state lands that will have the most to be able to go in there um, and, uh, and earn your turns. You know, some of the private landowners will let you do that, be able to go up and, and hike up in there. But, and a lot of them also just don't want to be uh, just don't want to be bothered as much, you know, because yeah. they don't there is a lot of liability and issues with that. And yeah. especially if it's a small place and there's not much left to see in the back, um, then they may uh, they may just kind of um, not really allow people to do that. But, you know, like I say, in the book, we tell everybody how to go and uh, um, and, uh, you know, check those out. Um, the ones that they, they can go to, which I those are the ones to be able to focus on ones, ones that are on town property, state yeah. property. Uh, to be able to go and earn, earn your own turns because it is also a bit different than what it is out west too. There's a lot of backcountry skiing out west where a lot of there's huge open spaces and wide open slopes that don't become overgrown. Right. But in New England, the trees come in fast. <laughs> so they really do. Right. It can be a lot more difficult to go down. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, 
my opinion also, I'm just going to insert it here. It's just like, as this sport grows um, with all these outdoor sports, uh, respecting private landowners is really important to make sure that mm -hmm. the sport can continue to grow. Um, mm -hmm. All yes, right. Exactly. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. We have an, a, a lot of thank yous and um, someone sharing that uh, they're going to email you because they have uh, old Cortina Valley ski area and the Catskills photos. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, yeah. Coming your way. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So another question, do you know anything about Innsbruck USA, which was located next to Binghamton, New York in the late seventies? Mm -hmm. Yep. I have uh, some of that information on my website. So they can go to nelsap.org and go to the New York section on there. And we have some pictures on the history of that, which I believe top of my head had a T bar or two, but we actually, I think have a trail map of that Innsbruck USA so that people can go on the site and be able cool. to check that out. Yep. That's awesome. Yep. Okay. And then one clarification is Ralph Townsend and Berlin, the same place. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's Berlin mountain. Um, so the Ralph okay. Townsend is on um, Berlin mountain. Yeah. Okay. And Perfect. Okay. Sorry. Continue. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And it's, it's a big place. That vertical, let me tell you, that slope is, there's nothing like it. <laughs> I think for backcountry people, if you want the, the, the most difficult slope to be able to get up to and ski down it, I would probably yeah. say that one is, is, is very high in the list. Cause that vertical is, cool. it's, it, you know, you're, 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 you're climbing up it like this. <laughs> it's really steep. You know, I promise people it's, it's a lot steeper than it looks in that photograph. Wow. And this is a slightly outside of what you just spoke about. This is my question. <laughs> sure. um, do you have websites that you like to use for like weather and figuring out, um, you know, what the snow conditions are going to be like at some of these places? Yeah, you know, it's if you're just kind of looking for like forecasts, like in general, you know, like the National Weather Service, if you want to use one of the public sites, just because it won't have as much tracking and ads and everything like that than some of the other, you know, weather yeah. websites might have. But they typically have snow depth maps out there that you can be able to check out. You know, obviously look at webcams, you know, kind of look at the snowfall reports. They put out public information statements after each storm to say who got what and how much is out there. Because um, you definitely want to go when there's a fair amount of snow. You don't want to push it with three inches on the ground <laughs> you're going to be hitting bottom and yeah, no one's making basically. any snow there <laughs> right no no they're not so you really need a lot to help cover up the hazards cover up the the roots and the rocks and the, the tree stumps that fall down so yeah yeah cool yeah. thank you yeah. um all right so we got some some extra info from tom the ralph townsend ski area is named after ralph who was the longtime ski coach at williams college and townsend was also a 10th mountain veteran who was seriously wounded in Italy. So Yes. Yeah, he was he was really dedicated um, from what I was able to talk to from former students and people that worked with him that you know Ralph was a good guy and he was he was well respected by the college there and really you know promoting the ski team out there and did a lot of that work. So um he was so well respected they named the ski area after him. So that was really yeah. terrific. Yeah. Seriously. Mm -hmm. Um all right, so we have another one um about the the landowners and the the ski resorts. Do you have a sense um, uh, the various ski slope owners were drawn to the business opportunity um, mm -hmm. or just the fundamental love of skiing? <laughs> it's a little bit of both. You definitely had yeah. some of these places that were um, that were people trying to make some money. You know, they wanted to start as a business. Um, of course, they, they say that, you know, like if you look at dollars, like if you want to make $100,000 at a ski area, start with a million first, you know, because that's what you'll end up with. You know, a lot right. of these were, were money losing operations. Um, and in fact, most of the larger resorts are the only ones that really can, can make a sizable profit each year, yeah. um, which is why we're also seeing people, a lot of nonprofits starting to run some of these places because they can just put the money back into it and kind of run them at a minimum and keep them going. But yeah, so people were attracted to it um by you know trying to to run it as a business particularly during the great depression and trying to you know it is amazing and you think about that all these areas developed you know in the midst of the great depression a lot of those uh, 13 of them before world war ii um you know without the infrastructure that we have out there now um but then you had lots that just love the sport like um like the uh the ski area there jacob's ladder started by those 10th mountain division troops so a lot of the 10th mountain division um ski troops started these places they worked with the patrols they worked as employees they built these places um and they love the sport they love being out in the mountains um and it's just part of their nature so with the sport owes a great deal of gratitude to members of that the 10th mountain troops that were able to do that yeah 
That's awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing how much the 10th Mountain Division is involved in ski history. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Across it's, the country, it's huge. Really. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, we're uh, 10 minutes after after uh, the hour right now. Um, so I did want to say thank you again, Jeremy, for being here with us and sharing. And just for everyone who is watching, um, I dropped a link to Jeremy's Berkshire's book, but obviously you can find all this stuff at nilsap.org. Um, so go check it out and dive into it. There's so much there. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> And um, hopefully you can join Mappy Hour next week. We have Skiing in Color with artist Lamont Joseph White, as well as a Gear 101 for backcountry skiers. So um, lots of stuff going on. We hope to see you again. And thank you all for participating, saying hi, asking questions and all that good stuff. And good night. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. This is great.